That's really important to get out there. Those of us who had to suffer, struggle through years of church history classes, we probably know that at different times throughout history, the Roman Catholic Church has conducted its Mass in Latin. Often long after Latin is a common tongue. So we look back on this today, and those of us now, we might be kind of confused by that. Um, you know, literacy wasn't like great through the, that time period of history called before now. And so a lot, for a lot of people that really, you know, mass was going to be the only time that they would really get to hear the scripture or um, some of the other um, liturgies of the church. And so this might be, this is happening for big periods of history and different times happening in language that they just couldn't understand. So maybe there's a working guy in the Middle Ages who literally couldn't understand the good news. Those of us in this room, and especially those of us who have to or get to preach regularly, we realize that our job is to take these ancient documents, these um, tr millennia old traditions and this Christian way of living, and then apply it to the people who God has given us to shepherd and to reach, right? So we, today, United Methodist folks, we would never hold our mass in Latin, would we? However, however, some of us, we go to Christian colleges, we go to seminary, we spend a lot of time in our office inside of our church building, and then maybe for some of us, we realize it's been a couple years since we've actually spent quality time with people who don't call themselves Christians. Our whole life and job is driving from one Christian bubble to another, and perhaps some of us don't realize it, but we're not speaking Latin but we and our people only know church speak, and we don't know how to talk to people outside the church doors about the good news. But, but Richard, dude, you don't know my people. My people complain so much. Oh my gosh, they complain about my sermons, about the worship music, about the color of the carpet. We've had a drag down fight about the color of the carpet. So you make little changes here and there, just to get people off your back. And one day, you, you wake up to find that your Sunday worship gathering is perfectly tailored to the people already in the room. What about the people outside those doors? Are they still coming? I want to just throw out a, some observations, and if you agree with me, I want you to say amen, okay? First observation, we all need young people in our churches Amen. I knew this would be a good place for that. Um, how many of us have friends that when, when they turned 18 and they went to college they, and their parents weren't forcing them to go every Sunday morning, they just took off and never looked back from the church? Amen. How many of us can name two United Methodist churches that are literally dying, literally as their church members die off? Amen. Another observation that I want to throw out there, and I would love an amen for this one, we all need non-Christians joining our churches and worshiping communities. Amen. Do we, sometimes I think we might forget that. We always get so busy with the people that are complaining or the people that are already there. When was the last time you had a believer's baptism? And I'm, I have Baptist roots, so I'm sorry. When was the last time you had an adult give their life to God and be baptized? This is what I'm really passionate about, y'all. And I hope that we're not... I hope we all have some passion for that because I hope that we, we don't get super excited about the shuffling of the saints, about taking people from nearby congregations because maybe they're tired of their church or it's boring or maybe their charismatic pastor took that cushy DS job. I hope that we're not passionate about making the hottest, coolest new service in town and taking people from the communities around us. I pray that we are all passionate about these lost folks, the prodigals, coming through our doors and finding God through our people. I have another observation. My third observation is not really amen-worthy. It's not like one of those passionate amen-worthy things, but I'd like you to think about it. 
My third observation is that I think for most of us in this room, our Sunday worship gatherings, or if you're a campus group or something like that, maybe you're like Friday night worship or Wednesday worship, whatever it is, your primary weekly worship gathering is going to be the main front door into your community. And what I mean by that is, I mean, um, though you might have your people, like, you know, you're, all of your people have neighbors, maybe who aren't Christians, or they have coworkers or something like that, but if, and, and they might come to like, you know, an event now and then. But if they're going to stick around and really become part of your community, they're going to have to come through that Sunday worship gathering and decide, is this where I'm going to stick around? Are these the people I'm going to throw in with? It can, can I get an amen? Like, maybe it doesn't have to be as passionate. It was like, if you think that's true for you, can you say amen? amen. Okay. So if we all need young people, I heard lots of amens on that one, and we need new believers. And if that Sunday worship gathering is the primary front door into our, com- our community, I want to talk about the languages that we use in those gatherings, in our musical worship, and in our liturgical practice. I want to get us in this room today to start thinking about where we might be speaking Latin to people who don't know it anymore. So because I'm a worship leader and a music pastor, I want to use the example of our music on Sundays to look at how we might be speaking Latin. Well, why? Well, Some of us might be familiar with some of the research. Music is consistently listed as one of the most important reasons that new folks stick around a community. Um, That is until they get relationally plugged in. That's that's really important to people. Um, Music today is one of the most nuanced languages that we have in our modern culture. Um, How many of us were driven crazy by the the generations before us of church leaders, like maybe when we were in high school? by church leaders who thought that there was two genres of music. Can you guess what they are? Traditional and contemporary. Right, thanks. I had planted, I just, I had planted Sarah out there. Um, I remember I was sitting with a middle-aged pastor, a uh, music pastor from San Antonio last year, and how blown away he was by the realization that the genre of music that he was employing was a language that the younger generation simply didn't understand. He was frustrated that the college students and young adults that surrounded his built church building didn't come through those doors for the worship gathering. And he had tried a contemporary service. Sorry, he tried a contemporary service. That was for Rob. But it didn't work. He had this idea that if you have drums and a guitar, kids are going to love it. <laughs> and I asked him, okay, I said, so I, we were sitting in a, in a small group setting. I said, so what musical artist does your contemporary band sound like? And he said a Christian band that I've never heard of. I, I, I have never heard of most Christian bands. So I said, okay, what's, a, um, what's a, you know, an artist maybe not, that doesn't get played on Christian radio that your, that your band sounds like? And he said, James Taylor. I said, okay. There's nothing wrong with James Taylor, guys. James Taylor's all right. My dad loves James Taylor. <laughs> and I said, man, I don't know how to tell you this, but those kids probably don't know who James Taylor is. But they probably quote Kanye, Jay-Z, all the time. Those guys, the San Antonio has an especially vibrant metal and hardcore music scene. And, and dude, you're trying to reach him like James Taylor? Yeah. How, I asked this guy, I said, how are you going to accomplish all of the things that our musical worship is supposed to do if they can't even comprehend what's being said? And this is kind of one of my points today. I would argue that this goes beyond like a preference thing. I really think that this is a linguistic difference. There's a true linguistic barrier there. The genre of music that we use is a language that can either help us reach the lost or hinder us in reaching them. Guys, I'm going to just throw this out there. People who didn't grow up in church don't listen to Christian rock radio. Uh, I don't listen to Christian rock radio, and none of my non-Christian friends in the Austin music scene listen to Christian rock radio. So, if by the grace of God, an unchurched person makes it through our doors on Sunday, not only are we asking them to be thrust into this new foreign experience of church going, but it's really clear to them very quickly that they'll have to learn a new language just to participate. So that leads me to some of the other elements of our, of our worship gatherings. Think about these as I go through them. I'm just going to throw some questions out there and think about your context. Your prayers and your liturgical material. What words are you using? It's cool. We love at Servant Church using traditional um, 
prayers of confession or great thanksgivings. But are there some words we can update maybe? There's a lot of thines and thous and these and things that I really don't know what they mean going on in there. Is there some words that we can just update and speak it more plainly? Abby Parker's really good at that. She pastors us very well in those. Do you have a lot of uber Christian language going on on your Sunday worship gathering? Do you say words like majesty, holiness, righteousness, sin, backsliding, edification, king, principality, travel mercies? glory or fellowship. Folks, most of these words aren't employed outside of the church culture these days. Most of us don't really know what they mean. I have an MDiv, and I don't know what I mean half the time that I say them. Um, these words, some of them have been, some of these words like have been co-opted by jerks. Um, like sin, like sin, for example, sin and sinner is a really good example of a word that has been co-opted by jerks who just want to make themselves feel better, who want to create an in-group and want to exclude, them, exclude other people. It, words like that have been used to separate people from God and his church rather than inviting them in. Now, hear me clearly. We need to teach people about sin, folks, but let's not default to the church shorthand, at least not on Sunday. There's plenty of hours throughout the week to do that. But on Sunday morning, our front door, let's spell it out. Sin is those things we do and the attitudes we have and that we live with that keep us from God and from each other. It's selfishness. It's the fear and the ugliness that we all contain. Whether you agree with my definition or not, say it in everyday language so people understand it and they won't be so offended or they won't be hurt by the in-group, out-group dynamics that have separated us from the lost for so long. Your sermons. What, uh, sermons can be a great time to def- define some of these words, but just because you did a uh, four-week study on the word righteousness four years ago, don't think that everybody in the room was there or was listening, you know? What, what themes in your sermons do you, do you address? Do you make room for struggle for darkness, for doubt. I found that uh, you have to make some room for these, um, just like the scriptures did, in order to reach young folks these days. Um, space, what is, how is your space laid out? Um, do you, are we like, is your worship space like this, where everyone's facing the front, and then everyone up front faces everyone back there, and it's just this, like, you produce and I consume kind of thing? Um, or do your chairs, like, is there room for them to face each other? What does that say? What language are you speaking? What, theologically, what does that say? Um, are we here to look at a presentation? Are we all in this together? Is your stage tall and removed like this? Um, what does that say about your theology and values? How is the lighting? What, is, what, how, what does the lighting say about you? I don't know. I'm just trying to get you to think. Um, your welcome table and your greeters, this is so important for keeping new people around. What kind of things do they say? Are they there there for like that first handshake and then they kind of move on to the next one? Or do you have people who on Sunday, their their whole job is to personally curate the rest of their worship gathering with them? Hey, my name's Kyle. Um, Come sit with me. Why don't you come sit with me and my friends? Hey, 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 this is my friend blank. You guys both, I don't know, ride fixies or something. Um, You guys should talk. (laughs) What is your church service called? Is that a welcoming name? It's, not, it's amazing what some places are called these days. Now hear me clearly. I, I'm not suggesting that we're changing, we change our message. There are things that we're definitely going to have to teach people, guys, that, and, and over a long time, and that's what discipleship is about. So for example, like the Trinity, if you, you say you understand it, you're probably wrong. Sin, salvation, an infinite God that created everything and for some reason wants to be with us and know us. The Eucharist. Scriptures, inspiration, these are difficult enough to teach people who didn't grow up with them. What we can't do is let the language that we use make it any harder. Are you speaking a real authentic message to your visitors, to your non-believers? Are you inviting them into life with you? Are you making them feel like an outsider simply by how you say what you say and how you do what you do? Where are you speaking Latin? 
Where has church speak become unhelpful in getting you to where you need to be in your neighborhood? So what does all this mean for you? What languages are you fluent in? I think it's important for me to say that I don't think we should all be fluent in the same languages. We are the church of Pentecost. We all have unique flaming tongues that we have been given. Who is it you're first trying to reach? And what flaming tongue is it that you need to speak to them? Who are the young and the lost in your community and surrounding your building that you haven't connected with? What languages do they speak musically? Um, what words wouldn't they understand were they to come into your worship gathering for the first time? And would those alienate them or help invite them into your life together? I want to close with three items of unsolicited advice. I've got a couple more minutes, and I've got a microphone, so I'm just going to throw them out there. First item of unsolicited advice, identify what languages you're speaking, both intentionally and unintentionally, and be aware of them. That's the first step. Um, I'm cursed with this thing called newcomer eyes, and so whatever we're doing on a, in a worship gathering on Sunday, I cannot help but think how this looks, how much sense it makes. Is it helpful for those who are at the first church service that they've ever been to? I bet each of us in this room have some people like that in our community. I would say identify them. Use them as a resource. Assemble, um, assemble what I call a fresh eyes team, but you should come up with a better name because that's a stupid name. <laughs> it doesn't have to be a ton of work, but identify some of these folks in your context, these folks that can see outside of their head, and um, I would say even ask some people who aren't Christians to be part of this. Uh, go to your neighbor um, and say, hey, Jeff. Everyone's named Jeff that I don't know. Hey, Jeff, um, thanks for letting me borrow the lawnmower. Hey, you know, I'm a pastor. I really need some help. My church, we're having trouble. We're just having some trouble. I need, I would love to buy you a 12-pack of beer, and we, we come over, and you can, we can drink it and talk. Okay, a six-pack of beer. 12 is probably too much for that. And say... You know, would you just come to one or two worship gatherings a year? I'll take you to lunch afterwards. And I'd like to know, I'd like to hear what makes sense to you. What doesn't? What made you feel really uncomfortable? What made you feel uncomfortable in helpful ways? What, you know, just get to know these things. And you can get this group together, like some of your people. Just whatever works for you. Meet with them individually. Meet with them as a group a couple times a year. But begin to identify where you're speaking Latin. How can you be more inviting with the language that you use? Two, my second item of unsolicited advice. Set your preferences aside. Um, how many of us pastors are held captive by our people's preferences? The type of music we do on Sunday is too loud. Um, the sermon content is too boring. The color of the carpet, you know, always comes up. The right question the right question to ask is, what will help us reach the lost better? That's a more important question than how we feel about what's going on in here. Pastor your folks to think outside of their preferences. What we found at Servant Church, and Servant Church is not perfect, we're not doing something in, like incredibly new, but one thing that we do well is, and one thing that we found is that if what we're doing is working and bringing in new people, people who haven't been to church before, people who left the church long ago and are finally coming back, people, everyone seem, tends to get on board pretty quickly. Guys, even some of the old ones. That's a that's big deal. Um, think about the lost. What do they need to hear? How can your people embody this message and speak it on Sundays more effectively? Um, I, I have this saying that I came up with off the cuff that's really bad, um, but it, someone was complaining to me last year before a worship gathering, someone that um, Abby probably knows who it is, and it's just, you know, like, it's just bringing me down. I'm trying to set up, and like, it's just like, oh, man, yeah, I'm, I know, I know, that sucks. Yeah, sorry. Um, then I just kind of stopped, and I pretended like I had heard this in seminary or something, and I was like, hey, three rules, buddy. First rule, um, this church thing, it's not about, it's not about you. It's about us. Rule two, this church thing is not really so much about us as it is about them pointing out the door. Third rule, if you feel like complaining, see rule one. <laughs> At least it ended the conversation, and maybe it can get you out of some of those conversations too. Finally, my last, um, 
My last item of unsolicited advice, and I'm gonna close with this, is make some freaking changes. Um, risk your job. Be courageous. Be dynamic. This is obviously easier said than done. Um, but guys, the status quo hasn't been working. And if, and if it is working for you right now, it won't be for much longer. Um, incorporate those who are far from Christ into your community. Um, one part of this uh, advice I would say is hire younger folks who might have a better language set um, to reach new people, to do ministry under your supervision. Um, work yourself out of a job. I'm almost 35, so if I'm still leading worship at Servant Church in 10 or 15 years, we, I, we probably won't be as effective in reaching the college students that are just a mile away at the University of Texas. And I believe this um, is true. If you build into your community a culture of speaking the gospel in the same language as the lost, all of your people will be that much more equipped for ministry in the world. Thanks.